personality snakes with feet. This is the Respawn Aim Fire Podcast, the kick-ass irreverent gaming podcast where three lifelong friends gather to talk about video games. I'm Chad Sweet. Michael Innes. That's Holden DePardo. Hi, I have questions, but finish your thing first. And you're you, the listener, and that's why we love you. Thank you for joining us here today. Holden, uh, I would like for you to raise your hand next time that you have a question. Uh, yes, Holden DePardo? Is a lizard is like a lizard really just a snake with feet? Is are those like nope. synonyms with each other? Nope. No, no. Here's the thing: if you cut a lizard's tail off, it'll grow back. If you cut a snake's tail off, that's half of its body gone and it's dead. <laughs> 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 that does not grow back. Although it will shed its skin, and then you could like use that as a condom. It could be like I picture a, a snake with legs is like a snake centipede. It's got like hundreds of little legs. Like help it move around. That yeah, sounds really creepy. And they all have and, boots, like, like the caterpillars <laughs> from boots. Super Mario. <laughs> and they got a little flower on its head. Whoa! We're going to talk about a lot of things today. We're going to talk about a Series X processor. This is really early in the morning for me, which is I am I'm trying to fake this energy right now and it's showing <laughs> what's up. I it has not been showing to me. Oh man! Well, let me show you my dick. Sex trafficking is a crime. We're- <laughs> Happy Sunday, everyone. I'm not laughing at sex trafficking being a crime. It is a crime. <laughs> to be clear, it is a crime. It is bad. It is, cr- it is not funny. <laughs> it's, there's nothing funny about it. No, there's not. Uh, and we're also going to talk about Pokemon. <laughs> Speaking of trafficking. <laughs> but we're going to start by talking about threes. Holden, tell me about you playing threes this week. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of segues. <laughs> so, um, Chadley, a little while ago, sent me a, uh, a screenshot of Jason Schreier saying, Game of the Decade, threes. And I'm like, Jason Schreier, you're right. That is the game of the decade. It's actually probably the game I played the most last decade. I love that game. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to play a bunch of that. And just like every little kind of moment I had to play mobile game, mm-hmm. I just went to threes. And what a lovely, enjoyable, amazing game threes is. Don't have much to say about it because I've talk, talked about it a bunch before. But if you haven't heard of it and you want to play it, it's a $3 game on iOS. There's no microtransactions. It's not free. Just buy it. There's a free version of it, but okay. buy it no, it's so good. No, don't buy it. Don't support so developers good. of games that you like. <laughs> Although I didn't like their most recent game that much. It was on Apple Arcade. There you like go. Guildlings or something like that. That's the that's the reason why you stopped buying shit. Yeah. But it was Apple Arcade, so they, they got taken care of. So they're good. Splatoon 2, however, I played that as well. Because my brother, uh, eight-year-old brother, got his first, his own personal Switch. He got Switch Lite. And so he's been playing a bunch of Splatoon. And I was like, why not? I'm going to play with him. And that game is great. And I actually want to put it in as a contender for game night. Because you can get eight people in that game. And we actually could use a game where you could fit that many people in. Well, if you buy it, what, here's what I'll do. I'll, oh, we both played Sea of Thieves this week as well. Sorry. Uh, if, oh, we did, yeah. If you make everyone buy it and they like it, then I will watch you all play it as one of you streams it. <laughs> yeah, so I want to talk about Sea I don't have much to say about Splatoon because, again, I've talked about it before. It's a wonderful game. It's really fun. I still wish that uh, Salmon Run was available all the time and not on an odd, random schedule. But anyway, Chad, Sea of Thieves, clearly you didn't like that game. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just offhandedly mention that your video and your audio are about a second and a half to two seconds off from each other, and it feels like I'm watching an old Chinese dubbed movie, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's great. It's great. My um, Chinese is excellent, by the way. Uh, shi shi. That's thank you in Chinese. <laughs> sea of Thieves. Yeah, we played it for game night. Um, one, I don't like it. That's it. That's yeah. the only item on the list is that I don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't a stretch for me to say that, because literally halfway through the, the stream, um, Chad goes, hey, I'm just going to watch the live stream. You guys can keep playing. Well, There's also, to be nice, to let Dallas and, yeah. and Joel and, and Matt and I play all together on the same uh, boat, because, yeah, it was very nice of you, but definitely was also fueled by the fact that you weren't having fun. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was, it was was upsetting to me, because there were three of us, and then there were two other people who were just, like, Joel and Dallas were both just like... I'm just going to keep spawning into the game over and over and watching the load screen so that hopefully our ships can align and then we can all try to like jankily figure out how to play together. But I uh, I felt like you. I felt like you and Destiny 
where everyone else was doing real things in the game and I was just running around playing an instrument. And I, <laughs> and I was like, why do people like this game? It's like, oh, because I'm not playing it the way that I'm supposed to be playing it. Um, I don't know. It, there was, it was so much more... It was so much more, like, sim than I thought it would be. Like, you have to mm-hmm. control... Everyone has to go and control the sails and make sure they're up and point in the right way. And, and tilt the sails the, the right way, which I didn't know you had to do until yeah. this time we played. Yeah. It is very simmy, yeah. And I was like, and oh, also that's too- a step too far for me. And also, it's <laughs> just like the combat isn't fun. It's, it's just swiping swords at skeletons, and you die too fast. And I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, di- I didn't... I had a fun time playing music and shooting myself out of a cannon and harpooning people from the shore. But I had more fun watching you guys play than I did play. I also think what happens too is that like Matt and I were talking about where to find the treasure on the map. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of feel like because Matt and I were discussing that no one else was jumping in to it because we were going to find the treasure, which kind of gave you not as much to do. I kind of felt like, um, that that's how I read it at least. Where it's like we were looking for the treasure, and okay, well they're looking for the treasure. What else do I do right now? Oh, I'm just gonna run around. Yep. Hey, question. Um, yeah. Um, I'm oh, sorry. Finish your thoughts on Sea of Thieves. Is it related to? Okay. Um, so I like that it's kind of calm and relaxing like that. Where there's not really a whole lot to do. Whereas thinking like Destiny, the reason of running around is just because I think the bounty system is honestly kind of terrible. Why do I have to run around this one location to get bounties when really it's just menus and I could just do that in a menu? I think it'd be more gratifying if I just went to a menu. Instead, I got to like run over and talk to this dude and he's on the complete opposite side of the map for whatever reason is the other people. And I just, yeah. I don't know, I just don't like that format that much, but I love the shooting mechanics and I like the the art design and I mean, it's, it's an impeccably made first person shooter. I just don't like the, the bounty system. I just don't, it doesn't speak to me. Um, this game though, is one of those things where like, I think I really enjoyed a lot, but I totally see why I was getting 5.5s uh, as like a review score out of 10. I think like IGN gave it a 5.5 because it really doesn't feel like that much to do. Yeah. It does feel pretty bare bones. Even though Matt Even got when... in the game and he's like, there's so much to do. And I was like, dude, you've literally like looked at a load screen. Like, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it must have been even more bare bones before. But I think I still enjoy it because it's kind of a nice change of pace from Destiny, which we've been playing a lot of in game nights. Where that's a really, Destiny's very fast paced. This is, hey man, like, just tell me when I need to tilt that ship a little bit more to the left. And it's just, I don't know, like, I kind of like it. The waves are so soothing to look at. The water is gorgeous. I, I also don't think you're going to the art style, because I love the art style. I don't think you were. The first no. thing you said was, man, these graphics suck. Well, like... immediately as I loaded in and my character was staring <laughs> at the sand and, like, the three pieces of grass coming out of the sand that are but actually just, like, hovering above it a bit. It's like, whew, all right. That's this oh, kind of game. I didn't even see that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I actually... I, I did get, like, a weird hiccup when I loaded in, and you know, I was, like, laying down on a table in the bar, and it, like, skipped it and shuddered in a little bit. It definitely had a weak impression when it came in, but I also, it reminded me of Wind Waker, and I think that's why I like it so much. Mm, that makes sense. Is it kind of has, it has that, like, ooh, there's an island coming up in the distance, and it has a cel-shaded art style, um, it, so it definitely hit a lot of notes for me. Um... We still have well, actually I just deleted Destiny to download Siege, so we still have Battlefront to play. We still have I deleted some other Battlefront games. to make room for Siege. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right, well we'll figure something out. Yeah, we'll figure something out. Uh, and you then I played play Destiny, Destiny two again. Surprise! I actually there's a there's a website called Wasted in Destiny, and it tells you how much time you've been playing Destiny across all platforms. And uh, I finally got curious. I was like, how long have I been playing it? And it was like 110 hours. But that doesn't count times that you're in orbit or loading or in the tower. So I'm sure that it's actually more like 130, 140 hours. <sighs> I just love it so it much. It says a lot about the loading times. Yeah. Isn't that insane? I spend most of my life loading. Yeah. And then uh, – but I was like – I came – I had a whole Saturday basically. I had like from the – from late morning to like early evening to play 
I was like, God, I really want to play The Surge. I really want to play Pokemon. I really want to play blah, blah. But I was like, oh, but I only have like four days left to bake all these fucking treats in the in this event that ends on Tuesday. And like, <laughs> got to jump into Destiny and grind to get all those ingredients and bake some cookies. So Wait, I did you that. you live to bake cookies? That's a thing? Oh, yeah. Destiny? I'll bake cookies and gallardoodles and all sorts of uh, hot cross fire buns. Also, there's bounties to go along with it. I'm sure you got to deliver them. Yep, to to Zavala. You got to deliver them to Asher. All over the the globe, the globe is plural because it's a galaxy. So it's, it's a solar system. Planets, bears beats Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, I played Destiny too. It was great. <laughs> <coughs> I love that game. We'll never stop. Can't stop. Never stopping. Won't stop. Pop star. We're going to temporarily end our Skype phone call right now. I'm going to call you back because I cannot deal with you being out of sync. All right. Welcome back. I didn't pause my recording. It was good. Just, it was Don't pause do. your recording. Great. We're just going to pick good, right back up. So we're going to go on to our fetch quests. These are quests that are just headlines that don't need a lot of explanation, except for there are a couple in here that I am going to give some explanation for because they don't make sense without any kind of explanation. Starting off with Sony releases new PS4 and PSVR sales data at CES 2020. This comes from Chris Cornelissi from Dual Shockers. Corn Cornelissi. Corn Ulysses S. Grant. Um yeah, there was a lot I was of thinking Cornelis. There was a nope, that's probably not it. Maybe. <laughs> That makes more sense. There's a lot of hype around, like, oh, PlayStation at CES. Oh, my God. What are they going to announce? It's going to be so great. And it was a lot of nothing, except for a car. There's a cool car. PS4 has now sold officially 106 million units. And PSVR, I think this is the big one. PSVR sold 5 million units so far. And for VR space, that is huge. Um, and this is a million. So there's supposed to be a billion. Yeah, this next one, 1.15 1. 1. billion games sold. If it was millions, like one out of every 10 people has bought a game to play. <laughs> <laughs> there are like 90 million PS4s with people do nothing on it at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, congrats, PSVR. You get it, girl. You get it. Next up, uh, Overwatch 2 has a release date hinted in now-deleted PlayStation tweet from Brianna Reeves at PlayStation Lifestyle, and apparently it could arrive in 2020. I thought that was confirmed that it was coming in 2020. There, there wasn't any release date or anything associated at the time. Really? Yeah. Really? Well, I guess that makes sense if there's a whole headline and an article about it, so <laughs> fuck me. Next up, have you been waiting for Elden Ring? Do you like Dark Souls? Do you like elves? Me, me, me. <laughs> we'll get another look at Elden Ring next month, says Brett Makadonsky at Destructoid. Elder S Elden Ring, Cyberpunk 2077, and Elden Ring. Oh, and, um... <laughs> <laughs> I was doing this late last night. Sorry about that. Um, what was the other one? Was um another game that's already been announced. Um, Sekiro. Last of Us Part 2. Last of Us Part 2. That's no, one. Elden Ring, Cyberpunk 2077, and Last of Us Part 2 will be at the taipei game show with videos what the fuck is the taipei game show i hadn't heard of it either i have never heard and, of this and this is why i feel like these vi these videos are really just going to be trailers we've already seen before yeah and i just want to just put that in there like i don't think there's gonna be new trailers i don't think last of us part two is gonna have a brand new trailer at the the taipei game show that we've never heard of before no get out of here taipei Ty Which is funny because it's still TGS and like the Tokyo hell? Game Show in Where is January. I'm like, no. Where um, is Taipei? Pretty sure it's in China. I believe it's in China. Here's Taipei. Taiwan. Oh, they would get That's very. Taiwan, they okay. would get very mad. They if would you get very mad. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there will also be several playable games there, like Marvel's Avengers, Marvel's Iron Man VR, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Neo Two, and Resident Evil Resistance. Uh, I guess technically we should be calling that Resident Evil Three multiplayer component now. Unless, are the they still selling that? Still called Resistance. It is called Resistance, but you're not going to go and say like, also available to play Uncharted Three, the multiplayer component. No, you're just going to say Uncharted Three is there to play. I don't know why I chose Uncharted yeah. Three. That's such a like old ass pick. Why would somebody pick that? Anyway, do you <laughs> think they're going to sell mean. Resident Evil Resistance as a standalone thing too? 
No. No? Because when they announced they, RE3, they announced they're like, that. Resident Evil 3 and our previously announced Resident Evil Resistance will be a bonus as a pack, as a multiplayer. I don't know. I don't know. I feel Although. like it'd be confusing because the game's out in a few months. I feel like it'd be confusing to, in between now and then say, oh, that game we said it was going to be included is also separate as well, by the way. I think it just it's all one package. Do you It'll think... people to buy the, the $60 game. Yes, I agree. End of that conversation. Do you think Excuse me. that Spaniards <laughs> <laughs> are just confused English people? If you oh think about God. the word April, and in Spanish it's abril, and it's literally just they like flipped the P upside down on accident. Maybe <laughs> Spaniards are just drunk English people. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I, you can't prove it wrong. Next up, Microsoft shares new technique for detecting online grooming of children in video game chat from Wesley Yinpool at Eurogamer. This is the one that needs explanation because without any explanation, it's like, I don't understand. Children are getting their hair combed online. What's going on? Oh, yeah. Grooming is. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're not familiar, when I was not online. until like 20 minutes ago, online grooming is when predators are like grooming them for sexual uh, manipulation and harassment and so there, there is now going to be some kind of um, AI to be coming through these chats and saying, oh, this looks like it might be an old dude trying to rape a young person. Let's have a human review this and intervene if they need to. And then they can uh, send it to the police as well, which is good. Send it to the post. Overall, this is a good story. Yes. No one should complain about this story. Are people complaining about the story? Well, we laughed at sex trafficking earlier, so I thought it'd be just to cover our <laughs> Just to be clear, I have never had just sex with clear. a child. Just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then finally, <laughs> surprise! Uncharted movie may be handed to Venom and Zombieland director, says Laddie Simcoe at Dual Shockers. Great, another like terrible movie Venom was, and now they're going to hand Uncharted to that, guaranteeing it's going to go down in flames if it ever comes out. Zombieland was fine. Zombieland was fun. It was fine. It was fun. It was fine. It had the unfunny version of Michael Sarah as a lead. And I like Jesse Eisenberg. Jesse, but Michael Sarah's uh, definitely funnier. Yeah, Michael Sarah is the better Jesse Eisenberg. But Jesse Eisenberg, it's just Jesse Eisenberg. He proved himself playing Mark Zuckerberg. That was an awesome role. He's a good actor. Okay, he changed a couple letters in his last name and suddenly he's this brilliant actor now. <laughs> <laughs> That's acting. That's yeah, acting that's is. acting. Acting. That's it for our fetch quests. <laughs> uh, moving on to our Microsoft Quest log. M -m 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 Microsoft Xbox exclusive. Xbox head Phil Spencer shows off a picture of the next-gen Xbox's processor on Twitter, says Matthew Olson at US Gamer. Um, apparently, Phil Spencer just keeps one of these processors in his pocket as like a lucky coin. Uh, and he carries it around. So um, it's similar to the, what he did with the Xbox One X when it was still the Project Scorpio. And if you'll, uh, one fun thing to notice about the the processor itself is that it does have 8K engraved on it. It does. As, in case anyone thinks that 8K is actually going to be a consumer level television type thing or experience by the end of this console generation. Or is it even a generation twist? Because our next story says Microsoft first party titles will be a cross compat will be cross compatible between Xbox One, Xbox Series X, says Rebecca Valentine at gamesindustry.biz. I've heard Rebecca's name before, but I had no idea it was spelled Rebahack. <laughs> I messed I switched the K. <laughs> I was like, I had no idea that's how you spell Rebecca. Um, <laughs> in an interview with MCV, which is apparently a UK news outlet, Xbox Game Studio head Matt Booty broke the news. I wonder if Matt Booty had anything to do with Sea of Thieves. He probably did. Quote, as our content comes out over the next year, two years, all of our games, sort of like PC, will play up and down that family of devices. We want to make sure that if someone invests in Xbox between now and Series X, that they feel like they've made a good investment and that we're committed to them with content. He also claimed, quote, one or two IP, quote, would utilize the power of the new console. Hold on, Pardo, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, one of my predictions is already wrong. And I, I predicted that Forza would kind of be the, like, Halo Infinite's the cross-gen game, but they want to have an exclusive game that's specifically made to take advantage of the power for all the seasons, of right. Series X. <clears throat> for all the seasons. There's actually going to be five seasons in the next game. It's going to be amazing. Whoa. Glimper. 
Um, That's the new thanks season. to the power of the Series X. Glimper. <laughs> Glimper. Um, I think this is such a strange move because I get that they're still saying there's going to be one. They said there's also going to be one or two IP that really utilize the power of the new console. But it just seems strange to me that I just got an Xbox One on Black Friday. And because of this, I'm now thinking, well, in the fall, I'll just get a PS4 or PS5, I mean. And I, I won't need to get an Xbox Series X or Series S, whatever the lower end model is, to play the new games. It's just, it's a strange move to get people to buy your console. I, it's definitely a long-term move as opposed to <clears throat> a, a launch move, which I have respect for. But it definitely is one of those things that, oh, we haven't seen this in the industry before. This feels weird. This isn't supposed to happen. Yeah. And I'm sure it's going to be fine, but it definitely seems very strange. It does seem strange. This is... Uh essentially the end of our traditional generations for at least xbox ps5 it sounds like we'll get to in a little bit might still be going that traditional route but i think this kind of goes back to what i was mentioning last week where they are redefining what success looks like to them they just care about if you buy their Mm -hmm. game i don't think they care as much about selling x million of xbox one i'm sure that's still a metric that Mm -hmm. they're of course measuring and trying to get as high as possible but um xbox series x sorry um yeah, I'm really happy that they are taking that. It's It seems like a consumer-friendly, consumer-first move. Mm-hmm. I'm now curious. I'm not I'm not, not sold on getting a Series X. I Still, at this point, I think I will get one. But I'm curious as to now what is the differentiating factor. Why do I get the Series X over what I already have on my entertainment center? Yeah. it's It, it also depends, too, on how that Crush and Tales get handled. Because when we went from PS3 to PS4 and that generational switch... We had Metal Gear Solid Five, Destiny. A few games were like cross-gen titles, but there was definitely a clear difference between what it was capable of on next-gen and current-gen hardware. Right. In fact, and it, even s- when you take a look at like Shadow of Mordor, like the Nemesis system <clears throat> wasn't on the old consoles, but it was on the new one. Exactly. So I feel like if it's like that, they need to convey that there are features like the Nemesis or whatever it is that can only be done on the next-gen system. Like, the next Forza game won't even have seasons on the current-gen oh, version. Shit. But the next-gen version has the, now the seasons now. Or, um, they, or they both have both. seasons, because we've seen them have seasons before, but maybe they just won't have trees. Don't have trees. <laughs> no tre- or no, <laughs> no cars. Trees. No cars. How would you know it's fall? Like, there's leaves on the ground, but no trees anywhere for them to fall from. <laughs> it's really strange. It's raining trees um, like squids from the sky. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, it's one of those things where I'm just I, I'm really curious how this plays out for them. Mm. Um, but it, why don't though? It's another example of Phil Spencer staying true to his word. He's always said that when he's thinking about what to do next, he bears the side of what's better for the consumer. And I think this is definitely better for the consumer because yep. you don't have to buy your hardware immediately. And I'm just I'm really curious as like an experiment how much goodwill towards consumers as a primary objective of the company really helps them out in terms of sales i'm crossing my fingers that it works because i'd like it if companies were nicer like this yeah but people have to buy the consoles to make that happen but i feel like sony we'll get to that in a little bit their strategy might hurt microsoft here yeah i've well you know that when when we talk about goodwill towards customers and like so uh, is selling consoles really like the ultimate goal that We've we've mentioned this a trillion times. Everybody knows this. Like consoles traditionally sell at a launch at a loss, especially at launch. Um, so it's not that's not where they're making their money. And this kind of links into another article I read this week where Phil Spencer said, "By the way, we're not giving all these crazy deals on Game Pass just to get people roped in. We are making money off of Game Pass right now. So, like, software is where it's at. That's where they make their money. So." As yeah. long as they can sell the game for sixty dollars or seventy dollars, if they're gonna whatever they end up being next gen, as long as they can sell mm-hmm. the game, it doesn't matter where you play it. And that brings up another point: like when they sell you a game, since it is compatible with all of these things, do you now just buy an Xbox game and you can plug it into your yeah. one, well, or think- you can plug it into the Series X? Is it one disc that works on everything, or do you have to buy, or is it going to be like last time where yeah, the game is playable on both, but you still have to have that specific version of it? I think to meet the promise of being of no more generations, it would have to just be a cross platform title that just works across both systems. And how do you I brand the disc? Count- it would what was that? How do you brand the disc? Every box that they now ship to GameStop, it's a 
do they have to re-release all of their other games with new packaging to say it's an Xbox game? Or that's a good point. That's probably something we'll hear about this year. But yeah, they might just say Xbox on the package now, and it doesn't even mention One or Series X or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, obviously, anything that's already been shipped will still say Xbox One on it, and they're just going to have to market and let customers know that your One titles will still work on the Series X and whatever the other one is. Um, that's a really good point to bring up. Another thing I'm thinking about, too, is how much they want to utilize the cloud to bridge the gap. Power of the cloud, baby. Because I think this time they can actually do that. That was kind of a joke throughout the last generation. But they, they I used do it on like Crackdown 3, now. and that thing got rave reviews. <laughs> <laughs> they did say that the, that part of the game was impressive, just that what they did with it was not impressive. <laughs> but it worked, technically. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. But let's jump into Sony now, because I'm. Th- I think we're kind of... In the biggest news of all time, Sony reveals at CES <laughs> the PlayStation 5 logo. Dun, dun, dun. Surprise. It's the same logo that we saw the last two generations, but with a 5 at the end. No and people other are pissed. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. The 5 does not look just like the S. It is not pissed. It doesn't. No. It's PS5. <laughs> uh, no new, um, other new information. They just kind of retreaded what they've already announced in other Wired articles at last year. So I think a lot of people are really pissed for a weird reason, which I think is that they're pissed because the logo looks the same. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is, is that they made at least like formal announcement of it. Like, look at our new logo. Like this logo should have just been like, just happens to be in a slide when they officially show off the PS5. Right. They should, like Xbox, they showed off a video about the new console, and then at the end, they just had, by the way, a Series X. That's what it's called. Exactly. exactly. No one was like, look at the logo for the Series X, because it wasn't important. I mean, it's doing well in terms of like Instagram likes and that kind of stuff. But like to me, it just felt really toned to effort. It's like, oh, last month, Microsoft showed off the box, the name, the fact that it's, it's, we already know it's coming to holiday 2020, and they showed off a game, and PS, PS5 was like, well, we got to respond here's a logo and it just felt like so like i don't know it just felt weak compared to what we now already know about the series x um and i'm sure that it's going to be a great console all that but like it was just a weird announcement and also at ces they didn't they've never really talked about playstation at ces before there's no precedent for them to there's a lot of stories of like they might talk about ps5 and most of the kind of editorializing around that rumor was, yeah, but they never talk about it there. So they're probably not going to mention anything at all. And they do, and it was a really odd kind of out-of-place response. So it was clearly only there for stockholders. Yeah. Just to remind them that it's still coming. I don't know. It just felt very strange to me. Yep. Yeah, if you watch that whole, like, seven-minute thing gap about PlayStation, it was 100%. It's like, if you remember, last year we talked about this in the Wired article. We announced these things, and here's a logo. And here's some stats. It was 100% just for stockholders to be like, "This we're on track. Here are all the things that we've done. Your yeah. money is good for us. Please keep giving us money. Um, <laughs> money, please. Money, please. Uh, speaking of all the things we know about Xbox, but we don't yet know about PS5, PS5's bigger differences have yet to be announced, says Brendan Sinclair at US Gamer. It's a quote directly from the horse's mouth, Jim Ryan. He says, quote, There are still more unique elements for PlayStation 5 to come that separate it from previous consoles. The, quote, bigger differences have yet to be announced. Whoa, what could this be? Does it come with a pony? Oh, my God. If you get a PS5 and it comes with a pony in the box, but it took, like, a week to get there from Amazon and a pony's dead. (laughs) It's just a dead horse carcass and (laughs) flies everywhere in the box and there's maggots crawling all over your PS5. That would be awful, PlayStation. I need you to rethink your strategy. (laughs) <laughs> um, what do you think the biggest differences are do you have any theories it's going to be shaped like a fucking goose V like a fucking flying V like fly away home that movie from the 90s god <laughs> I am on fire I remember today that movie. I get that reference I think it, it could be that it could be the rumor of the controller having the little display where the touchpad on the PS4 controller is oh yeah 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 um, but I'm, I just had a thought right now too which is did they – there was a rumor of the silicon in the the PS5 CPU being kind of tailored to uh, – with VR in mind. Right. Was that a rumor or did they actually confirm that one of the Wired articles? There was something in the Wired articles about VR and I can't mm, remember if they mentioned that or not. I don't not. remember. I don't 
I don't remember. remember. I don't remember. Hmm. The Either way. The 21st night of September. <laughs> <laughs> I believe this. I believe that they have bigger differences. We'll just have to wait and see. I'm excited. I mean, it's going to be a big year. I'm very, very excited for it. I feel like the bigger differences have to be services based or software of the PS5 and what it's able to do. Like, we, when they showed off, like, you can stream straight. It wasn't straight to Twitch at launch, but it was straight to Ustream or whatever. Straight at launch. And you, there's a whole dedicated yeah. share button. And this, and you have share play and remote play and all these kind of, like, those are the kind of big, like, feature announcements that we got for PS4 that I think are still yet to mm-hmm. come for PS5. Aside from just, like, you're going to be able to load into Uptown New York in no time in Spider-Man. <laughs> this is a big deal. Though. I mean, yeah, that's a big deal. But, yeah, we still have all of those big software things, I think, that are coming. When are they going to announce it? Ooh, according to an investment firm. Ooh, ambiguous. They expect Sony to skip showing PS5 at E3 2020, and the investment firm calls it a huge mistake, says Matthew Olson at US Gamer. There are anonymous sources that claim that Sony won't be at E3 this year. Wedbush Securities analyst Michael Pachter confirms, quote, As far as I know, they don't plan to attend. I think that's a huge mistake, as their focus on the consumer is not inconsistent with their attendance at the premier industry trade show. I hope they change their minds, but am skeptical. By this time last year, they had already announced that they're not going to E3. In fact, it had been a couple months. They have not told anyone that they're not going to E3, but they also have not told anyone that they are going to E3. But I feel like they have to have some kind of presence, whether it's actually at the trade show or whether they pull a Microsoft and EA and just like have it in the parking lot outside the trade show. Like they, <laughs> <laughs> they've got to be there. It's a, it's a tailgating party to announce PS5 stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, and or if they like pull a Nintendo and like their press conference is a video, but then they still have a presence on the show floor. Like they have to have. Something like they do a state E3. of play for E three. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree. They have to have some sort of presence at E three. And if this were just like any random analyst, I would be like, bullshit. They're they're going to be at E three this year. Michael Pactor's the one though, and I'll explain why. That I'm like, no, I think this might be legit, possibly. And here's why. Michael Pachter, I've been following Pachter Factor, a show of his, for a few years now. And around E3 time, he always makes a big deal about his E3 party that he invites everybody to. And he's like a big like investment person, so like he gets legit people there. Like Phil Spencer has been there. Lots of like journalists have been there. Tons of game developers are there. And Sony has had a presence. People like who work for Sony, like um, uh, Jack Trenton had been there before. He would know. If they were going to be there, because he's already inviting these people to his E3 party. <laughs> so I feel like even like business stuff aside, like his social reasons for, uh, for being at that event does give him some insight that's unique to know whether they be there or not. I agree with you, though. They should have announced it by now if they weren't going to. Maybe they're relying on, since they weren't there last year, they said they kind of might consider returning at some point in the future. They're assuming the default is now just not going to be there, maybe? That should not be the I assumption. Don't know. But I think that they should. I think they have to have a presence. All Otherwise, I know, they're just... If we go to E3 this year and I don't get to touch a PS5, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take a pee right in the middle of the floor. I don't care if there's carpet. <laughs> I think you might not get to see anything else of the entire event because they'll kick you out if you do that. But <laughs> if you want to do that, you can. Mm, they won't even tell. They won't even tell because I have a micro penis. <laughs> the only benefit I think to Sony not being at E3 would be they don't have to compete for the big PS5 reveals with with other announcements and stuff. But would they really be competing anyway? Xbox announcing details and PS5 details would be the biggest announcements at E3, regardless of what happens. At this point, Half-Life 3 is real, so I can legitimately say that. Mm, Half-Life Alex is well, real. Well, Half-Life Alex is real. And it takes but place Half-Life, between 1 and the, 2. The next Half-Life is real. You know what I mean. The next Half-Life has like, been announced. They're not going to announce 3 at E3. That'd be weird. Speaking of announcements of games, PS5 will reportedly have PS5 exclusive titles at launch. This is contrary to Xbox. And this comes from Lou Contaldi at Dual Shockers. Jason Schreier says on his podcast, Kotaku Split Screen, not to be confused with Split Screen Gaming Podcast. 
<laughs> and they had this to say about the PS5 launch titles. Quote, I've heard some of the PS5 launch titles. I won't say them yet because I'm probably going to do some sort of report on this stuff in the future. But those will be PS5 only. Now, to be clear, the Xbox version said Xbox first party titles will be playable across other generations. Didn't say anything about third party. This could be referencing the same kind of idea. Like third parties will say, yeah, there's I'm making a PS5 exclusive title. But also, I kind of want a PS5. I want PS5 exclusive first party experiences because I feel like they can really make them shine and make them amazing and show you really Mm -hmm. what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. But Absolutely. I also say that because I know um, I'm getting a PS5, and I don't care if other people don't get it. So, a hundred percent, I'm more excited for PS5 uh, if this is true. Like, if these two things are true, I guess we already know the Xbox One is true. But if this is true, which it seems totally plausible, Sony has not pitched this as anything but a new generation. Right? They're not pitching this as like a generationless uh, up- upgrade, like the PS4 was. I, I'd be shocked if they didn't have launch titles. I'm still rooting for it being Ratchet and Clank sequel. That's what I'm I'm rooting for. I'm gonna let you root that. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, I think this just seems like a given. And I think like I said earlier, I think that this is gonna hurt Microsoft if Sony can be like, look at this incredible looking game that didn't have to think about the previous generation at all. And even though this box costs less and isn't quite as powerful the game still looks way better because it was custom made for this system that could hurt microsoft especially if they're saying but the games will look amazing on the 600 hundred dollar box or 500 hundred dollar box whatever the series x ends up costing and it is more than the ps5 but again that's gonna make them look bad i think that could hurt microsoft's console sales of xbox series x but i don't know if that's what they're judging as successful anymore it's like cool that game's great but you're gonna sell maximum like a million or two units to launch, whereas we could sell 50,000 of our game because it's available across all of these things. Like, that might be more successful for them. Yeah, but they still don't want to make the consoles and not have them themselves. So, like, if there's, like, hey, you can spend $600 and get this console, but the exclusive games are still going to look better on the PS4 anyway. Yeah. I think a lot of people will just say, well, I'll just get these. It's $100, $200 cheaper. I'll just get the PS5. And... Eventually, Microsoft does want people to get those Series X because they can't rely on Xbox One going into 2023. They right. have to have that install base beforehand. So, I mean, again, you're right. Their, their metric, the, how they're viewing it might be differently, but hopefully it actually plays out to their advantage that way. Still got to sell boxes. We'll see. We'll see, Speaking boys. Of boxes. Nintendo has a box. And it's the same box as last year, but with red on it to let you know it's a longer battery life switch. But unrelated to that, (laughs) there's a new Nintendo Switch Pro may be released in 2020, says Matt Kim at IGN. We've heard these rumors for a thousand, you guys. One thousand years. Digitimes reports that Switch Pro will allegedly start production in Q1 and release mid-2020. Analyst predictions also back this claim. Um, Cool. I'll believe it when I see it. I believe it's coming sometime. But, I mean, like, people have been saying it. There's been so much smoke. I'm ready for some fire. I'm curious as well. I feel like not this year. Only just because the release cadence of hardware updates from Nintendo is generally every two years. They just released the Switch Lite. They'll, if, it, if they keep that same release rhythm, it'll come out in 2021. Not this year. But here's the thing. I also here's don't the think... Thing. What if holiday 2020... PS5, Xbox Series X, and a Switch Pro Breath of the Wild 2 bundle. That would sell freaking gangbusters, Holden. I I think that Nintendo would be better off just releasing Breath of the Wild 2 and then waiting till next year. Because I don't think they want to release new hardware against the PS5 and the in the uh, next well the Series X. I think that... But it's mid-2020, so it's months removed. But people will know the price at that... Well, I'm assuming they would know the price at that point of mm. this, the PS5 and Series X. Well, here we go. So, I don't I don't know. I just feel like it... I, I don't... I if Even as a big Nintendo fan, as someone who probably would buy a Switch Pro, I would say, I'm not getting one right now because I have to buy 
one of the other consoles instead. I already have a Switch that plays the same like Nintendo games that are going to be on the the regular Switch. I don't need a Switch Pro to play those games. And if you look at like their track record of making a more powerful system, DSi, name me an exclusive game for the DSi that was meaningful. But when they make a game same for an exclusive as... it's not exclusive, but you could play Smash Bros on 3DS or the new 3DS and one of them was a trash experience and one of them was great. Same with Hyrule Warriors. One of them was a trash experience, one of them was fine. Well, technically, both of them are trash experiences, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Smash Bros, no, that's that's a fair point. I don't play Smash Bros. I also don't think like Breath of the Wild 2 would run super shitty on a regular Switch. Who knows, Holden? Because both of those we'll other see. things were first party, and they still ran shitty on the hardware. Hyrule Warriors is a first party. It was third party. Was it third party? Mm-hmm. A partnership, though. Like, they had some control over quality of that game. It's been the same team that made Dynasty Warriors. The same studio. Dinosaur Warriors. <laughs> Dinosaur Warriors. Dino DNA. IGN founder offers hint at one of the rumored Wii U ports coming to Switch. <gasps> I just caught a bug in my hand. Oh, God, what do I do? Do I clap? <laughs> Where'd it go? Oh, maybe I didn't catch it. You didn't it. catch it in your hand, then. You just thought you did. Maybe I just thought I did. And it's gone, but it's not flying around my head anymore. Anyway, on the Nintendo voice chat, Per Schneider claimed that, quote, the secret Wii U ports that are being discussed, one of them is a 9 out of 10 for me, and one of them is more of a 6 out of 10, end quote. And then he added that, quote, he really liked what Nintendo did with their take on real-time strategy games. Hmm, what could these be, Holden? Should we go back and look at Per Schneider's reviews of all the Wii U games and see what they are? I'm sure you've already done that. Hit us with the numbers. <laughs> I, I haven't, because he didn't review those games. He doesn't review games anymore. Then why does he even have review numbers on these things? He's, he's saying for him it's a 9 out of 10. Oh, my God. And a 6 out of 10. But um, if he added in there that he really liked what Nintendo did with their take on real-time strategy games, there's only one real-time strategy game Nintendo has made, and that's uh, Pikmin. Fire Emblem? Probably, that's not That's turn-based. Oh. So, very likely. Was there could a Pikmin on Wii U? Pikmin. Yeah, Pikmin 3. Oh. That came out? That did. Exactly. That's why really Did the Wii U Switch. ever come out? <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, I think that's probably what it is. Um, I just really. I really, really want Wind Waker. That's just that's the Wii U port I want, is the HD remake of Wind Waker. You want the port I mean, of the port of Wind Waker? Like this is yeah, the port of the port of Wind Waker. Well, it's it's the remake. It's a port of a remake of Wind Waker. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. That game was gorgeous. Oh my god! Why don't you marry it? Speaking of marrying, let's move on to our third party quest log, where we make no references to marriage. Square Enix is making steady progress though on next gen <laughs> games. Says Armina Khan at PlayStation Lifestyle. In Square Enix's New Year's letter, they say, quote, We are not only making steady progress on developing next-generation console titles, but also actively readying ourselves to support cloud gaming, which we expect to take off with the advent of 5G. From a game development perspective as well, we will strive to create gaming experiences only possible in the cloud, meaning developing cloud-native or cloud-centric games. Whew. I, in my head, saw Square Enix but thought Capcom. And I was like, oh, this totally makes sense because they did Resident Evil 7 cloud version. I was like, no, fuck, that's Capcom. Shut up. Square Enix is now just hopping into the game with cloud stuff. <laughs> <sighs> that cloud, 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 cloud. Good for them, man. This is... What do you think it's going to be? Final yeah, Fantasy 16? Think... Another port of 15? A different game of Final Fantasy 15? <laughs> well, they're saying they want to make cloud-native or cloud-centric games. So... I mean, that could be Final Fantasy. It could be Final Fantasy 16, but I feel like Final Fantasy 16 would probably just be a regular console game. They wouldn't want to keep that dedicated to the cloud only, even though RPGs would actually work really well. Well, I mean, what if it's uh, like a 14 or an 11, uh, an MMORPG? There's also that as well. Um, I th- I'm more excited for the cloud-native, cloud-centric part, because I feel like cloud services aren't going to 
take off and are never going to replace consoles on the, until they can do things that console games can't do. And this is the only way to do it. So this makes me really excited. And I think Square is obviously a company that can make really high quality AAA games. So very much looking forward uh, to that. I think it's very obvious that their next generation console title is probably Final Fantasy 16. <laughs> Just taken. I don't know if I would say very there. obvious, but I would say it's incredibly likely. I mean, how long ago did Final Fantasy XV come out? A long time ago, but also think about how long it took yeah. for Final Fantasy XV to come out. It was announced as thirteen Final versus Fantasy thirteen. Yes, but that's because they were making thirteen and thirteen verses together, and then they. I think just held off in development of 13 verses for a long time, worked on the three different versions of final fantasy 13, which the last one released in like 2011 or so. So it's like a four years. So we're already at that four year mark from final fantasy 15. Um, there's the DLC to take in mind for as well. Looking at the release date for final fantasy 13 or Re- lightning returns, whatever it was called. But also think about, like, so I, from announcement to release of all of their games. Even Final Fantasy VII Remake, like, it's been years since they announced that and is finally getting a third of it released in March. And we haven't even heard I'm anything of 16. I'm being optimistic here. That's so out of character for you. Stop it. Are you sick? <laughs> <laughs> um, It came out. Sorry, I just took me a while to find it. Came out in 2014, actually. When did Which Final Fantasy XIII come out? Final Fantasy XIII three is what I'm referring oh, 13 to. 13 came out in 2009. Just ask Siri, dude. It took you like 95 minutes to find that on Google. Well, because I was talking to you and typing. See? I just wanted to focus on you because I was talking to you. But you didn't focus on um, me, and now I feel neglected. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I'm thinking Final Fantasy 16 probably isn't that far away. That's my guess, at least. I think you are 100% I, I, wrong. I, well, they I think had an talked announcement about wanting of Final to, Fantasy 16. Hey, 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 hear me out here. They, they, had, they had talked about wanting to lessen the time between announcing games and releasing them because they acknowledged that Final Fantasy 13 versus was just, just a disaster because they announced it like a decade before it ended up coming out, and they didn't want to do that again. <laughs> they so they said it, that, but they, they have not actually practiced what they preached. But this is what they're gonna. This is when they're gonna practice right, it because we haven't heard hope. anything about it yet. Let's hope. Lord of the Rings: <laughs> Gollum confirmed for PS5 and Xbox Series X. Says Chris Priestman at IGN. This game has been announced previously last year, uh, but it, it they have said yes, it's a PS5 and an Xbox Series X game. Actually, they said it more like this: <laughs> stupid fat hobbits. That's how they said it. But it's not going to sound like that because this Gollum is not based on the movie Gollum. It's going to be based on the books. Correct. Fun thing about it, they said, uh, in the books, there's no uh, there's no size reference for Gollum in the books. Yeah. So like, this the I first illustrations ever made of him, he was like the size of a mountain. So they're like, we're going to interpret this how we want, and we'll see how this goes. Uh, a couple of background things on Datalik Entertainment, who is making the game. They are based in Germany and made a lot of things you've never heard of. Dark Eye, Deponia, Chronicles <laughs> yeah. of Shakespeare, Ravensburger, The Whisper. <laughs> I love that name. <laughs> a lot of shit you've never heard of. Uh, so who knows about... They're also point-and-click games. Yeah. Which is interesting, because this is supposed to be an action-adventure game. Well, it is a, an action-adventure game with stealth gameplay, a dual personality man- mechanic, huge levels, and a move away from the violence that dominates other Lord of the Rings games. Martin Wilkes explains that the dual personality mechanic, quote, it's not just choosing to be Smeagol or Gollum, because for Gollum as an entity, it's not that easy. Each personality is being attacked by the other. Each has to defend himself. This could be a really cool game, or it could be a huge fucking flop. Yeah, I. that's why I put in the background information on the other games that they've made. Yeah. Because they mostly have made point-and-click games, and now they're jumping into this stealth game with a dual personality mechanic. Um, uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. But they have a contract to make multiple Lord of the Rings games. It's, I wonder if Lord of the Rings Gollum, Lord of the Rings colon Gollum, there's something about using the Lord of the Rings name that they have to be licensed through, like, they have to pay a shit ton more money, or maybe they're licensed through WB or something like that, which is why... 
Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor are Middle Earth Shadow of War, and they're not called Lord of the Rings. Like they're setting that same thing. So I wonder whether that says anything about the quality of this game is whether it is officially licensed Lord of the Rings. I don't know. Yeah. And finally, it's a pretty small studio too. It's 150 people or something like that. It's not very 150 big. people. I couldn't even fit that in my apartment. That's so many people. <laughs> Alexis. Panasonic breaks out of VR's headset bubble with fresh eyeglasses designed for VR. Says Kyle Orland at Ars Technica. If you have not looked at this, look. It looks like some kind of like steampunk <laughs> goggles that you yes. put on. Um, and, and they're not even really goggles and they don't wrap around your head they have like the traditional eyeglass um what do you call the things on the side of your glasses uh, i call them just the arms of the glass arms so there that's you go. Not the right term my arm take my strong hand uh they have those um apparently it will eliminate the screen door effect with micro oled panels at 4k resolution per eye um or for both eyes per eye oh, per eye or both eyes no, we don't know yet but 4k resolution oled panels yeah um, apparently, Kyle notes The Verge had trouble Panas- had trouble with Panasonic's new eyewear being too front-heavy and falling forward when they leaned over. Great. Is there room in the VR headset space for more VR headsets? I don't know. I mean, I don't, we saw Oculus this. Quest come out and freaking rock the boat, so I, there could be, but mm-hmm. I feel like there's so much out there. there was, I was at the Microsoft store recently. Just, you know, dicking around in the mall. And there's – they, like, prominently feature some VR headset that I have never even fucking heard of. Like, I've never even heard of the company that makes it. I was like, how many Probably VR mixed headsets? reality. It's crazy. How yeah, many There's a lot of mixed there? reality headsets that work with Windows. Um, I think what interests me about this story, though, is that they're changing up the form factor and trying to go more for eyeglasses. Um I'll, I'll, I'll keep this light because I do know things – because of some of the work I did at Oculus, we talked to some Qualcomm people, and this kind of fits in line with like where they're going. And I'm being very vague. There's a lot more to it that I'm not alluding to, but I can't really talk about it too much. But like I saw this and went, oh, okay, so one of the steps. This is cool. Um, this is progress. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But there's going to be some cool things in VR, considering this is kind of where... I had been promised they were going from internal discussions. Ooh, hold I've in. Already... Did you already just break an NDA on our podcast? Ooh. No, I didn't say what's going to happen with it, but this is a, a step towards that. Take a, one exciting. foot in front of the other, and soon you'll be walking out the door. Thank you. Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> Next up, we're moving on to our main quest. We've got a quest, and it is full of shit and good shit, bad shit. Who knows? We'll talk about it right now, but that makes it enough shit to be main. Main quest. <laughs> Pokemon Direct happened on January 9th, 2020. That is 20 years after the second millennia of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> there is a lot of information that was released. Um, you've linked to an article that says only one or two sentences about it at most. Um, but here are some things that are happening. They are forgoing your traditional Pokemon Sword Shield gun, like that third version of the game, and instead opting for DLC expansion packs. There are two expansion passes coming later this year. There is the Isle of Armor, which is coming out this June, and the Crown of Tundra coming out in fall 2020. These will be able to work with your current save files so you can keep all of your progress and just explore these extra regions. There are lots that come with them. There are uh, more, I think it's 200 more Pokemon from previous generations that are now available. So all of you people who are freaking out like fuckers about the Pokedex. Oh my god, I did kill that bug. It's dead on my trackpad right now. God, I'm so good. Fucking Mr. Miyagi, come to my house. Um... Yes, so if you're freaking out about the Pokedex thing, you don't even have to buy these games in order to get that update. That will be free when these things come out, and you can transfer them using Pokemon Home, which is coming out in February that we saw during that release, um, and transfer them to your game so you can have all of your old-ass Pokemon that you've been transferring since Ruby on Game Boy Advance for some reason. 
Uh, what I really like about these is that they're focused on different things. The Isle of Armor was more about like story content, I think it was, and then Crown Tundra was more about exploration, and there is a ton of new legendaries and things like that. There's Galarian forms of Moltres and Zapdos and Articuno in there as well, which look really cool. There are different uh, legendary Pokemon. There's the Cub Fu Pokemon that can like transform into a fighting yeah. dark type or a fighting something else. There's a new grass type legendary, which looks like a hot air balloon with a wreath around its neck. Um, <laughs> there's all sorts of fun stuff coming to it. Um, Holden, I want to start with the subscriber interrogative from Dusty Elbow Hill. Dust E. Hill on Twitter. He says, quote, thoughts on new expansion pass for Pokemon Sword and Shield? Good? Bad? Smart? What are your thoughts? I think it. I think it's very smart of them because, first of all, the mid-generation titles like the Ultra Sun, Ultra Moons, Black and White 2, those games don't sell as well as the initial generation jump. Um, Granted, those are always like $40 titles, whereas Sword and Shield was $60 and the DLC is $30. But I do feel like they're actually going to stand to make more money by having people who bought the $60 game spending just an extra $30 as opposed to convincing someone who bought Sword and Shields to buy an entirely new game. The fact that they link together and it's in continuing your adventure that you already had, I think this is just really smart of them. I think it's going to do them very well. It also kind of makes Pokemon feel more like, I'm, I'm assuming at least, because I haven't played them yet, but I'm assuming it's going to make it feel a little bit more like a living, breathing world because it's expanding and growing, and I can see new things in that same world in Galar. Um, I'm, I think this is a really good move. I'm, I'm very happy with it. Uh, also including more Pokemon. Like this is how, this is why they didn't do all the Pokemon initially because they know they're going to have DLC to keep adding over time. And I think it'd be really smart of them to just even make this the Pokemon game, this generation for the switch and then just keep adding DLC and expanding the game until all the Pokemon are in it. And that's kind of like how they handle a generation. I think that'd be really clever of them. Yeah, this is really a, and it's a new way. It's a new way of thinking about expanding upon an existing world that we have in Pokemon that they mm-hmm. haven't done before. And they mentioned this in the direct where they're like, previously yeah. up until now, we've done things differently. We release an extra game. Sometimes it is a third game set in that world. Sometimes it's a remake of the other, like, or something that adds something new, like Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. And now we're doing something different. And I think this is going to pay off for them a hundred percent. I, with Pokemon Sword, I've still only gotten to the wild area like i just got to the wild area did a raid or two and that's all i've done i haven't touched it since i plan on getting more to it this month but we'll see um i watching this was like well damn i am excited for more of that stuff because i remember with uh with let's go pikachu and w- with most of the ones that i beat uh omega ruby alpha sapphire i did alpha sapphire like i get to the end of the game i beat the elite four and then it's like there is some post game content and I'm, but I feel like it's mostly like go just find more legendary Pokemon, and there's not a whole lot around finding them. It's just they happen to be in random spots throughout the world, or you have to fly into this weird thing in the sky. And so actually having huge new areas to explore will be really exciting for me. Um, and that'll I'm I'm already thinking all right I'm going to get this thirty dollar pass even though I haven't even played more than seven hours of the first one. <laughs> So it's exciting for me, and I hope that this is kind of the the route that they go from here on out. Absolutely. I also think that it's going to take – it allows them to experiment with Pokemon, where if they had released just a mid-generation like Sturdy Sturdy Shield and Sharp Sword or something like that, um, which I think that would have been an awesome name for the expansion pass. No, I think that's super dumb. (laughs) (laughs) It would have fit in with their trend of how they – like Mega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire and – a heart, gold, and soul, silver. Would it kind of fit in with that? Um, so it allows them to experiment because they don't have if they don't have like a new generation or mid generation game to release, they don't have to have another eight gym story. They can they hate, like they can experiment with it and create this land and make that land for a different type of Pokemon story we haven't seen before. And because you still have that eight gym experience in the game that the DLC is a part of. It's not like if that's an experiment that doesn't quite work out, it's kind of fine. They still have the traditional Pokemon experience that's still a part of that game. So I think this could also really help them take Pokemon in new directions going forward without doing things that are that that could really risk the Pokemon brand. So I think this is going to work out very well for them, too. It's kind of a win 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 for everyone. Win win win. Ooh. 
uh, when they when they were announcing this in the video, and they're like, "We have two expansions coming called Isle of Armor and Crown of Tundra," but they hadn't talked about release dates for them. I thought. That it was going to be like, if you're sword, you get this expansion pass. If you're shield, you get this one. And I was about to be so pissed. I was like, how dare you lock all of that cool icy content behind <laughs> another game that I don't have? And I was like, oh, they're both coming to both. Thank all of the gods. I I would be surprised, though, because I, I think it is. I should go to my Switch. I think it is two separate expansion packs still. It is. They have a sword one. Okay. Uh, I but, hope there's it's, still some exclusive Pokemon. No, it, there maybe? are exclusive Pokemon to them, and okay. there are like exclusive characters. Like they even talked about right now, you can go and if you're playing Sword, you'll meet this person, and you'll have a chance to catch the Galarian Slowpoke. If you're playing Shield, you'll meet this person there instead. So like that's right. There are still some exclusive right, yeah. type things between them, but it's not like this entire yeah. expansion is only available to Sword, or this entire expansion is only mm-hmm. available to Shield. No, I knew that because there's the release dates, one in June, one in fall. Right. Um, but, I, yeah. I'm happy with it. I'm excited to get it. It'll be fun. It'll be good stuff. Yeah, I'm mostly I need to actually just like still that, do that the... legendary hunting. That's that's the post-game content that I like. I never got into legendary hunting. I usually just beat Elite Four, then just stop playing with that Pokemon game. I remember when I got so, Alpha Sapphire, I, like, called out sick to work. And I'm like, I'm going to catch all the fucking legendary Pokemon I can today. Go to get, yeah, fucking Registeel. Get in my library. My Pokedex. <laughs> It'll be fun. I'm. I do wish that they had talked about Pokemon Sleep. I'm curious. Well, here's what the, the deal with that game is. Here's the thing. Pokemon Sleep was not a was not announced or part of a Nintendo Direct. That was part of the Pokemon Company's Pokemon press conference. Yeah. So I feel like if we ever see stuff in a Nintendo Direct, it's going to be exclusively related to Switch. Whereas Pokemon mm-hmm. Sleep is an iPhone, iOS thing. So I feel like that's going to be something that the Pokemon company handles on their own. Well, they talked about Pokemon Home, in, which they announced the same day as Pokemon but Sleep. But that's still, that's still Switch content. Yeah. I know, but it's still like a mobile uh, you know, application. Um, but you can't use it? Sleep. You can't use Sleep on yeah. N- Nintendo Switch at all. I the think they still call that Direct, though. They announced all this stuff. They still called it a Pokemon Direct. No, it was a Pokemon press conference. Oh, okay. Alrighty. Alrighty then. Moving on to our subscriber interrogative number two. If you would like to write into Respawn Aim Fire, which you can, you can do that by tweeting at us at Respawn Aim Fire on Twitter or Instagram or Respawn Aim Fire gmail.com. Matt from Rhode Island writes in and says, What are your gaming New Year's resolutions? He says it just like that too. New Year's resolutions. That's how Matt sounds. <laughs> Holden, what are your gaming New Year's resolutions? I have one, and I'm embarrassed to say it. Oh, God. What is it? What is it? I am going to beat The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask this year. Oh, that's adorable. Holden. I need to do it. Yeah, you 100% should. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, I've heard. It's, like, it's my favorite Zelda story. I've heard that, too. Not just from you, from so many people. Why haven't I played this game? Why? Because you get Jack, by the time you end why? up getting to the Zora Temple, you're like, oh my god, this mechanic is is fucking killing my brain, and that's where I always got stuck as a kid. Always made it all the way to the Zora Temple, and then fucking gave up for some reason. It's actually exactly where I stopped. I Listen, told you, I, but I didn't. <laughs> but I didn't do the dungeon at all. I just walked in there and went, cool. I'll come back to this. What a great place to start the game again in a dungeon. And then I'm like, uh because yeah, you spent it, all that time getting those I, fucking eggs. And then you're like, ugh, finally got all the eggs, and now I'm going to do the whole temple. And you're like, we'll, fi- we'll pause here. Yeah, that's what I did all the time. <laughs> but man, when you get all the masks and your fierce deity link, and you're just like fucking shit up, it's so badass. Skull Kid is so cool, too. God, what a cool-ass game. What a cool-ass game. Chad, what are your resolutions? Oh, I thought long and hard for about 45 seconds about this question right before this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Probably play more Beat Saber, right? More Beat Saber? Uh, uh, for course, for course, what am I? Um, <laughs> for course, <laughs> of course, I'm gonna play more Beat Saber for sure. There we go. Of course, for sure. That's like a take luck moment. If anyone knows Brian Regan, the comedian, I don't, I don't know that. Um, but oh. here's here's one that I'm making up on the spot that I want to make happen, and I know Matt's gonna be on board for this. I want to beat all of the raids in Destiny that currently exist. 
I don't think that's a hundred percent possible. Now that we're going in, you're, you're sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, the raids themselves, once you knew the mechanics, it's all just about communication and repetition, and that was totally fine. Like if we go back and try Leviathan, now that we actually researched what it is you have to do, regular Leviathan raid, not prestige, regular Leviathan raid, we could beat it in sixty to ninety minutes easy. Um, so yeah, I want to beat all the raids in Destiny Two. That's a thing. I also, we are going to play Bioshock Infinite this year and wrap up that trilogy. So yeah. that's a resolution. That's a resolution right there. I'm down for that. Um, it's a new year now. I'll, I'll allow it. That was my whole thing is I wouldn't do it the same year I played Bioshock 2. Got to give it some time. I'm ready. I'm ready. ready. My body is ready. And then I think... I think I'm going to play through the entire Master Chief collection as well before Halo Infinite comes out in the fall. It's a okay. big goal. It's a big goal. All of Reach, ODST. All of them. All yep. of them. I've never played ODST. I've only played like the first couple missions of Reach. But I've played Halo 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I have not played 5. Stretch so. goal. It's not in the Master Chief Collection. Halo Wars 1 and 2. No, not at all. Fuck strategy games. No, not at all? No. <laughs> not into that. Thank you, Matt, for writing in with that subscriber interrogative. And everyone else tweeted us. I'm really just curious what everyone else is, is doing this new year. What is your New Year's resolution for gaming? Go. Tell me. Right now. I'll wait. I already answered. Oh, other people. Gotcha. Other people. Ten. Nine. <laughs> eight. If you're not on Twitter already, you're wrong. Seven. Six. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Welcome to Game on Game Show, the game on our gaming show where we play game on a game on a game show. Game, 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 game. We have, returning for the first time in a long time, Video Game Would You Rather. Woo! Yeah. That's my baby! We have three Would You Rathers <laughs> based around video game mechanics or tropes. And Holden, we're going to discuss which one we'd rather do. Are you ready? Mm. Yeah. Would you rather be the merchant in an RPG in the first town... Who only knows how to make shitty armor, <laughs> or be the first boss in an RPG where you're worth so little that the big bad guy only gives you really shitty grunts to help fight with you. Either way, you are so undervalued in your life's purpose because you are a merchant, but you are the shittiest merchant literally on the entire planet. All you know to do is make cloth robes. Me. Or... You're a big ba- you're a boss, but like you're so undervalued that like no, you're gonna get some fucking slimes to help you. This is an easy decision for me. If I'm like a worthless merchant, here's the thing. That merchant, when you come back to that first town in the game, is still there, which means his business is still doing well enough. Like he might not make the best quality things, but he's probably got a comfortable life. Versus that first stage boss that's like worthless is usually like super overconfident as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, you know, you'll never beat me. And then you beat them super easily. And then they're dead. And that's it. But if I'm that merchant, I've lived comfortably enough to like keep going by making some things that are like, oh, all right. But if you but live your whole other passions, if in my you life. live your whole life with just like, a real shitty existence. Is that worth living the life at all? I mean, again, like... This is deep because... and philosophical. But... <laughs> nope. <laughs> because I don't, like... I'm making great stuff. I'm probably not spending that much time making it in the first place. So I can, like, pursue other things. And I can have, like, a good home life and stuff. Because, you know... I don't I'm... know. Because I can return that, to that, that town at any time well. of the day. And you're sitting there waiting for me to, to buy a robe. Well, usually I feel like the merchants live where they they work, so mm. I'd, I'd just be at home. You okay, know? okay. You're, you're a work-from-home merchant. Yeah. I want to be a stay-at-home coal miner one day. <laughs> 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 I don't know how that's going to work, but I'm going to do it. You know, your basement is just like a, is just a giant tunnel there to the, the mine, yep. and you just kind of go up a tunnel back into your house again. But it's I would, part uh, of the mine still. I, I, would, I think I would agree with you that I would be... The shitty armor person. Because I know at least that I make that shitty armor well enough. Because if you go to some of the end game towns, they're not going to have a robe for sale. I'm the robe guy. You want to be comfy after mm-hmm. you take a shower and rub your naked dick against my fabric? You can do that, and you're going to be great in it. <laughs> but 
if I know that I'm doing my best in a role as an enemy and my and a boss, but nobody recognizes that, and I just get passed over for promotion after promotion, and I'm still stuck in the stupid dead end first dungeon, I couldn't. That would drive me fucking insane. So I'm going to go with the merchant as well. But side note, how freaking like Bowser and Sephiroth and all these people? Why don't they just put a stronger guy in the beginning of the game? Boom, and that saves everything that they need. Like they don't yeah, have to worry the, about. Put the penultimate boss of the game, the one right before yeah. you, as Sephiroth or put Bowser. Put him in the first in the town. First... Yeah, and then you don't have to worry about this kid fucking up your entire day. Here. Here's the thing, though. Actually, just I mean, I'm still sticking to the same answer I have. Mm-hmm. But using Bowser as an example, and some of the first bosses that you fight there, you fight the same boss over and over again. So you get consistent work, and you don't die, but you just get the shit beaten out of you. It's like being a pro wrestler that's designed to lose. Yeah, yeah. It's like Leonardo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where he's always like he's a big name. But he's always playing the bad guy to some new up and coming. It's going to beat the shit out of him until it ruins his reputation. And now he's never seen as a leading man again. Mm-hmm. And he has so to struggle for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Spoilers for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh no, that's like it's literally a scene from the first like ten minutes. I just saw it again in theaters yeah, like two days ago. It was great. Uh, next up, would you rather be a Jedi who's deathly afraid of ropes, or? <laughs> Be a space marine who forgot to wear his ammo belt from Halo. So you can't, like, you, everything that you're shooting or throwing has to be held in your hands or, or in your arms. So you can't have a belt filled with grenades and swap out this weapons. Is, this is easy. I want to say thank you, George Lucas, for making the ridiculous prequels. Because I can't reach that rope, but shit, I'll just jump really fucking far because apparently Jedi's just can do whatever they need to do to get past obstacles. So I'll just jump really far as a Jedi. <laughs> that's mm. that's how that's going to work. Mm. But have you played Jedi Fallen Order? Because sometimes it's still too far for you to jump. You didn't say it was in Jedi Fallen Order. You're right. You said it was a Jedi. So here's the thing, too. Outside of Jedi Fallen Order, I don't know if I've ever seen a rope in a Star Wars movie. No. Well, well. to be fair, there's it's kind of a rope. It's like the little like grapple hook that Luke has in A New Hope where he swings with Leia. Mm. But he... It. Oh, and there's the, the vines that he swings on in Empire Strikes Back. Swing from a hairy vine. I can be your backpack <laughs> while you climb. If you've not seen that bad <laughs> lip reading, it is the funniest fucking thing on the planet. <laughs> That log had a child. Oh, my God, Yoda. You're so stupid. I love it. Um, <laughs> That's what baby Yoda grows up to be. Just a nonsensical, <laughs> crazy person. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I would be a Jedi who's deathly afraid of ropes because it, they are so infrequent in that world. Yeah. What do they use to tie things? Their shoes. What do they use to tie their shoes? Anyway. They're self-tying, like, in Back to the Future. Mm, that makes sense, because Back to the Future, they go back in time. This is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Totally makes sense. Yep. Finally. It, well, it's... Keep going. You're good. Our last would you The logic rather. makes complete sense. I can't... Yeah. You, you can't... There's nothing to add. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. Scott Michaels. <laughs> would you rather be a diabetic teenage girl trapped in a goose's body... But you can't communicate to anyone that you need a snack for your blood sugar, so you're just an asshole to everyone trying to get their attention. I don't know if you know that, but that's the real backstory to Untitled Goose Game. (laughs) You're a diabetic teenage girl (laughs) trapped in a goose's body. (laughs) Or, every 12 birthdays, you evolve into a larger, more unrecognizable person. (laughs) Um... (laughs) <laughs> I would pick the second. I would pick the second one because I. I feel like I would just die at that point if I was a duck who's <laughs> yeah, diabetic. Like yeah. I'd be dead. You're very quickly become a dead duck, <laughs> or a dead goose. Excuse me. And every twelve years, it's like, oh, I get to kind of like reset a little bit. That's kind of cool. Yeah, but then I'll all of it. your loved ones are like, I don't even know who you are anymore. You have a different personality, your hobbies and your interests Oh, I have a different change. personality as well. I thought I mean, it just looked different. No, I mean, if you look at like, like Charmander's personality versus Charizard, they're very different. See, I always viewed it as like, 
it's a baby Charizard, so he's a little bit more like uh, Charmander's baby Charizard. He's a little bit more like naive and sweet and free going. And Charizard at level thirty six is like lived life, you know, just like get out of the way, fuck it, I'm just doing whatever I want. I'm gonna burn this place down. <laughs> so he's like not a different person. He's just you know, he's he's weathered a little bit. Uh, they are, th- in this example, they are different. You are unrecognizable, not just f- like physically, but unrecognizable as as the person you used to be all right so let's say worst case scenario my loved ones all that kind of push me away and, you know like what whatever um sad yeah definitely sad i'm Very still sad. alive you are still alive. and now i'm like and but i have a different personality which means that i'll probably be capable of different things and we'll see a different life as a result, but if we it could learned... be a bad life because it's like a flip of a coin. Is his personality going to do me favors or not? Because you could turn into like a fucking dick. Here's the thing: we learned from Robin Williams in Bicentennial Man that <laughs> <laughs> that even though you we can... learned something from that movie, <laughs> <laughs> even though you can live forever, sometimes you don't want to because you might find the love of your life, and when they die, you want to go with them. Is that a stipulation? I have to live forever. No, but what I'm saying is that every 12 years, you basically have to yeah. abandon the relationships that you've built with everybody. Like, what if you don't know oh, yeah. that? <laughs> what if you want to die with them at the end of the 12 years? <laughs> okay, it's I not exactly like Bicentennial group. Man. <laughs> 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 Although he does evolve. It would be like, it'd be like Freaky Friday, kind of. I don't know. And the Freaky not Friday really. with Jamie Lee Curtis, who eats Activia to poop. And uh, what's the what's the other girl's name? The one who eats drugs to live. Lizzie Lohan, <laughs> Lizzie Lohan. Eats Lohan. drugs to live. <laughs> who eats drugs to live? I just wish she goes to the doctor's office. He's like, oh, the the cocaine levels in your blood are very low. They're dangerously She's low right now. She's just running around as a goose. She's like, guys, I need to crack rock quick. <laughs> So she's just stealing people's rakes and tying their shoes together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my game on game show, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> he eats drugs. To- <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you are, uh, if you'd like to go to patreon.com slash <laughs> <laughs> patreon.com slash respawn aim fire <coughs> you can uh, support us at one dollar or above and get the ability to influence what we play play along with us every week on game nights and get dope wallpapers uh, if you are playing along with us anyone you don't have to be a patreon member to play along with us each month and write us your uh, reviews on the games we are playing the last guardian this month as our barf game backlog accomplishment with respawn and friends uh, so play that. If you have played it in the past, let us know your thoughts on it. Either tweet us, DM us, email us. Um, let us know your thoughts. Until next time, here's our usual sign off. <laughs> Just give me a crack, rock. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that was a good one. <laughs>